I vote for happy. <laughs> Actually, before I um, start, first of all, thank you for getting up so early, and I know you're here for the company and a nice breakfast, and hopefully I won't give you an ingestion with anything I talk about. Um, before I start off, I want to introduce Mark Scully, um, who has a quick announcement regarding capstone opportunities. So, um, we'll just take it from there. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my job here, part-time with the university, is to attract field study clients. Most of you, uh, some, many of you, will have uh, experienced that in your capstone class. Um, it's uh, roughly two and a half months. What's different about our program is that it's free to our clients. Uh, Carlson probably charges a minimum of 20 on up. Um, and we have really good students. And we've been able to attract very good clients. Um, just some clients we've done work with, three of them. H.P. Fuller, Pillar CRT, which is a uh, big public relations firm, Proto Labs, fast growing uh, company. We're dealing with a startup that is, I think, disruptive. So that's why we're dealing with them. GDA Services, a uh, uniform company. and. Uh, uh, in fact, we're doing a project for Hamlin, and that is how to better work with alumni. So that's an interesting program. Anyway, I'm going to be here afterwards. Um, please contact me. I'd love to do uh, work with some of you. And um, so if you don't, if you don't have something right on your mind, uh, you can always get my information from Jamie or Molly. Anyway, thanks very much. Thanks, Mark. Well, it's nice to see some familiar faces. And I need to mention to you before I get started that we have a couple of faculty members here who um, teach in the conflict area, whether directly or as part of a program for Ruthio, who teaches in the nonprofit program, and he has a background in conflict. And Susan Mangler, who really should be standing here other than me, but She's got a nice breakfast and she's sitting with colleagues and friends. So, so, um, so you, some of you may have had a chance to, to take classes from either of them. I don't know if others are here. How many of you have taken um, either, not necessarily a course from me, either a conflict course here at Hamlin or a negotiation or something like that? Or, um, yes, I remember. Okay, so, well, so this will be a review session for you. Um, so get out your notebooks and talk about it. Um, it's very difficult to go into great depth in 45 minutes. So what I thought I would do this morning is touch on a couple of key points and really make this a little bit more conversational um, and see what interests you. So. I'm going to go through a couple of basic things. I've got a couple of handouts that I'll give you shortly, one with the PowerPoint slides and then another, an instrument that perhaps some of you have already taken um, that's a conflict assessment instrument um, so that you have at least some concrete takeaway from, from this morning. Um, but I do want to make this as tailored to, to what um, you're interested in um, as well as things that I think about all the time. So, when I think about conflict, I, and maybe, maybe you think about it in the same way, conflict is an inevitable and a very important part of our social lives. Um, we are social beings, we interact with others all the time, and we are not cyborgs, we are humans. And because we are humans, we have our own standpoints, we have our own ways of thinking, we have our own psychological makeups, we have our own personalities, we have all of that package of what makes us who we are, which is very enriching. But it also means that we have different needs, we have different ways of making sense of our social experiences, and there is inevitably and necessarily going to be moments where there's friction, issues that interfere with where we think we need to be going and so on. So conflict is its just part of our lives. And 
maybe some of you have heard this, whether it was with the class with me or with Susan or Rob or Mark or others, but it's a source of energy. Conflict is an essential source of energy. And the question is not whether to have conflict or be in conflict. The question is how to move constructively through and work constructively with conflict. So that's just a quick framing piece. A couple of quick things just to kind of frame how I think about conflict. And again, a number of you probably have seen some of these slides. When I think about when, or when, when we often think about conflict in a classroom setting, our first way of thinking about it is what do you do about it? How do you get out of conflict? And I want to suggest to you, and some of you may remember when we've had classes together, I, I suggest this to the classes, the first question is not what to do about conflict. The first question is what's going on? How do we understand the conflict that's happening? And so I often show this slide that there are two very important dimensions of understanding and working with conflict. Mostly we think about the second one. How do you make it end? Often because it can cause anxiety. It can cause an emotional reaction that we don't like, that makes us feel uncomfortable. And so in many respects, we react to conflict as a means to rid ourselves of that inner feeling of anxiety. But that's all about, well, we can each say it, it's all about me, not all about Ken, but it's, it's that self-focused drive, which is <coughs> our reaction to something. It is not the something itself. And so a first step, I think, in working with conflict, the slowing down and backing up and developing a presence of mind to reflect on well, what is going on that is triggering this reaction that I'm having, that's causing me to feel the way I do. And again, for some of you who've, who've had classes together, you know that that's where I spend a lot of my time. So, what I'd like to do is spend a few minutes talking with you about ways to understand conflict, ways to think about what might be causing that reaction. And then I'll spend a few minutes with some, just some broad brush ways of thinking about how to engage or respond um, to conflict. So I'm actually going to skip ahead of that slide. So understanding conflict is a relatively complex thing. And you can think about conflict not as existing at one of these levels, but something that exists at all of these levels all at the same time. So when you have that inner reaction, you, you see that coworker walking down the hallway, and suddenly you feel tight-chested, and that impulse to go and tie your shoes so you don't have to make eye contact with them, right? That's that inner experience. Having that inner experience of conflict with that coworker might be better understood at an interpersonal level. But neither of these two levels operate in isolation or in a vacuum. All of conflict is contextual. And so it's also important to be aware of what's going on in the larger environment within which you work. 
So you work in organizations, and I'll bet you could, in very short order, identify who your group is and who those other groups are in your organization. Whether it's a different department or a different division or a different unit or just a different team, group dynamics are also very important. And in one of the classes that, um, that I teach, the theories of conflict class, one of the perspectives we look closely at is social identity. And how our own sense of self and how we know ourselves and how we find positive self-regard occurs in some measure through the groups with which we identify. And that naturally leads to in-group and out-group dynamics. And you would think that in-group and out-group dynamics would be, well, I work for Coca-Cola, so Pepsi must be the enemy of the, the out-group. Or I work for FedEx, and so it must be the Postal Service. But often it's, I work in accounting, and it's, it's sales people, or vice versa. So understanding our affiliations, our group ties, who is part of our own home team, also helps <coughs> understand conflict. Because we think about and make sense of and understand people differently depending on whether we consider them one of us or one of them, even within organizations. And then finally, it's important to think about the organization as a whole in terms of the culture of the organization. So if you have worked for one organization and then you've moved to a different company, chances are you felt like you've moved to a whole different world in some ways. There are different unwritten rules, different ways of doing things, different ways of expected behavior, different cultures. And then you also have a social dynamic that's not specific to an organization, but that you carry around with you. I happen to be white, cis, male, professor. That's part of my identity that I carry with me wherever I go. I grew up in California. To my knowledge, only Rob knows me well because he's from California. We're, that's right, you know, we're, we're part of this group, right, right Rob? Okay. Regional background, family history, religious affiliation, race, gender, sexual identity and sexual orientation. All of these characteristics inform who we are. And then you add on top of that the globalization of the workplace. And how many of our colleagues, maybe yourselves, bring different national and ethnic and regional cultures in the workplace. It's amazing how successful we are given the complexity of the workplaces that we work in. So, I start with this slide in part to give you permission to feel okay that, oh, you know, we're not doing so bad. We have little, we have little bad feelings occasionally at work, but you know, on balance, it's a complicated place when you do pretty well. So, start off by congratulating yourselves for all the success that you've but you didn't come here to celebrate your success. Chances are you came here not only to listen to this, but also to even talk with your friends, but to think about how to be better, how to do better. So I'm going to back up one slide now and show you what is what I describe as a, um, a conflict flow chart. Just to give you, I'm not going to go through all of the elements, but just to give you a very broad sense of how conflict tends to unfold. And then we'll go through a couple of a couple of other things. And um, I'll tell you a little story and I'll give you an assessment of something that we're going to work on together and 
that will pretty much bring us up to the stuff. So I think of conflict as something that unfolds through time. And depending on how you think about conflict and how you look at it, and whether you're a sociologist or a psychologist or a communication person or a lawyer or whatever, you think about what conflict is very differently. But at some point, there's a trigger where you experience something that you would describe as a conflict experience. And that starts here. This, you, this is my very bad attempt to make lightning bolts. <laughs> or the sun. Okay? And you'll notice that I've got a whole bunch of stuff within the sun. So it's nothing to do with what do you do about conflict. It has to do with thinking about what why and how we experience conflict. So this moves forward through working through conflict. So what are some of the, the various characteristics or factors that shape how I'm going to move through conflict, how I'm going to deal with conflict? And then I'll get a little bit more specific about the workplace. <coughs> Well, one category of things that influence how I deal with conflict are what I call individual factors. And I just covered those with that, those, that little gas flame with the intrapersonal, interpersonal. So my own core values and beliefs or my worldview, my own personal characteristics, my lived background and experience, my social identity, and so on. These things I would call relatively dispositional characteristics. If you want to get into family systems and you're the oldest child of five children, you view the world differently than if you were the baby of the family. I happen to be the youngest of four. I think being the youngest is always the best place to be. <laughs> Just ask my older brothers, they'll agree. I was, I, I was spoiled. I deal with the world differently. Right? So those kinds of factors influence how we deal with conflict. Then there are contextual factors. So this is a little bit more dispositional. This is a little bit more situational. So contextual factors include things like social and cultural influences, situation and role definition. So the way you experience an event at home may be different than the way you experience an otherwise identical event that happens at work. The context differs. Different parts of your personality are can surface at work as opposed to in your private life. And then social location, which is the flip side of social identity. And social identity is who I, how I define myself. And I gave sort of those social characteristics of me. Social location has, is how other people view me and locate me within a social power structure. So again, just using myself as an example, I happen to be privileged because I am seen as a straight white male. And that happens to be a socially privileged place to be. That follows me around when I go to meetings, when I negotiate, when I'm working with teams. If someone identifies me differently, either by race, or religion, or sexual identity or orientation, or any other very variety of characteristics, they might view me and therefore judge me differently. That affects conflict. So this may feel a lot like psychology, but it really is, as I've said, and I I know several of you, you may remember, I said in class, look in the mirror. Understanding others and understanding conflict begins by looking at yourself. And understanding who you are and how that reflection that you see navigates social interactions. So that's, we haven't even done anything with conflict. This is the whole work before you can get to it, right? And then finally, I put here because of the class, the learned theory or lens, sort of 
how we train ourselves to work through conflict. Now, one of the ways that we often learn to work through conflict is through trial and error. And as we grow up from childhood into adulthood, we learn how to cope and we learn certain skills and we develop what are called habits. The thing about habits is that they are largely correct, but not always correct. So I'm just going to make up 80%. Let's say that they work 80% of the time. So those 80% of the times you encounter a situation, you fall back on your habit, and it works for you, and you work your way through, and you either feel a sense of relief, or you sort of force your way through it, and then you survive or whatever. But then there's that 20%. 15 or 10 or whatever, where it doesn't work. That habit becomes what is called a trained in capacity. Where you don't know what to do except what you've always done. And not all situations fit your habit. And that can lead to intensifying conflict because if you beat your head against the wall twice and the wall breaks, then you, then you know you should beat your head against the wall every time. But when the wall, the wall, when the wall doesn't fall down, you just keep beating your head against the wall more and more and more and more and more. And it gets, the conflict gets more and more intense. Right? So another piece of working with conflict, and I know I'm being very abstract. I'll give you a couple of concrete things. But another piece to working with conflict is just because what you've always done works 60%, 80%, 90% of the time does not mean that's the golden rule. That means that that's a habit that has worked for you in the past. So if something doesn't work for you, to develop the presence of mind to say, wait a minute, I'm moving from habit to trained in capacity. Maybe I can stop and rethink doing it different. And that's a skill development area. You're not going to pick out an alumni breakfast, but a recognition, an awareness of when things that usually work stop working, that's useful to know. That's useful. Okay. So this is all just sort of prepping for, prepping for that moment of conflict. And then conflict breaks out, and there are two broad paths that you can follow as you work through conflict. And that's what these arrows are. <clears throat> up here and then down here. <clears throat> I'm going to make an overly general claim. Doors closed. A couple of experts will offer me feedback later, but let's assume that what I have to say is accurate here. That in our culture, dominant American culture, which is generally an individualistic culture, where we value the cowboy, we value the go-getter, we value the person who gets things done. When we face conflict, we tend to follow this upper path, which has what's called the individualist focus. And the individualist focus is where I'm right and you're wrong, so it's really all about me figuring out how to get you to, to, to see the error of your ways. The problem, though, is that the person I'm having the conflict with is having exactly the same reaction. It's not that I'm right and they'll come around. It's that both parties often start with that place of I'm right, no, I'm right, and then the dynamic shifts into a power struggle. A power struggle is all about winning and understanding and working through the source of the conflict is often forgotten. The conflict is an irrelevant trigger to your ego or to your need to be right or your need to show that you're strong. That doesn't get it. That just gets at you feeling better about yourself if you win, or feeling worse about yourself if you lose. Right? And the way we often 
deal with conflict through this individualist focus is, and again, my apologies for those of you who sat through this in class, the exercise of power. And there are different sources of power. There are three very common ones. Coercion, reward, and persuasion. Coercion is the threat or actual use of punishment in order to get someone to yield, to lower their resistance and do what you want to do. That's where your team leader says, I know you're getting married on Saturday, but would you mind coming in Friday night? Mm -hmm. And the would you mind is a euphemism for it. If you don't, mm -hmm. I'll never forget. Mm -hmm. That's coercion. Reward is the other side of coercion. It's the offer of a benefit in exchange for lowering your resistance and doing something you otherwise might do. Now, reward's not such a bad thing, especially if it's a bonus or a raise. But it's still an indirect inducement to get you to do something you otherwise probably wouldn't do. Notice that coercion and reward, again, they have nothing to do with the source of the conflict. They have nothing to do with what's really going on. It's all about motivating someone to change their behavior. Persuasion starts to get at the core of what you're trying to work through. And we probably use that a fair amount. And persuasion is about me figuring out how you think so I can get you to change your thinking. Mm -hmm. Notice all three of these to use, since Rob and I are from California, the energy. The energy. Notice the energy of this individualistic approach is all from the standpoint of I'm right and you're wrong. So I've got all these ways that I can go about helping you see the world the right way. Parenthesis mine. So it's still an element of a power struggle. Now that's not inherently bad. And in fact, that leads to a competitive dynamic, which can lead to deeper, better thinking. It can, not always. The consequence of going through conflict this way is we tend to harden and become more rigid in our standpoint. Which means that if we happen to not be right, or if there happen to be other ways to do it, we're not open to them. Then there's the second path, which I call the dialogic focus. So if you face conflict, the individualist focus is, let me figure out how to very nicely tell you how totally wrong you are. Then the dialogic focus is a more open path of exploring together and not only being strong and assertive about my standpoint, but at the same time being open and amenable to changing, changing my standpoint. Not needing to be right, but being willing to listen and to hear. And you'll notice that there's a bridge between this triangle up here and down here. Trust and empathy. And these are two very important characteristics that help move from that rigid, I'm going to make you come around in my way of thinking, down to that more open dialogic focus and leading to a point here. So think about the workplace. Think about people you know. And in your mind, compare two different people. Person A, someone you don't really know very well or you don't really trust very much. And compare that with someone for whom you have a lot of trust. All other things being equal, I'm going to suggest that we interact with them very differently. And that when things emerge 
problems or conflicts or things that don't go well, when things are triggered, the person who you trust, you're more likely to have a conversation with. The person you don't trust, you're more likely to prejudge and label, which is a setup for a destructive conflict in So instead of talking about what do you do, what are the skills to, to deal with conflict, what I'm suggesting is work on trust. But then there's this other, it sort of begins in that, oh, wait, there's more. <laughs> so, but then there's this little arrow that I put in here down to empathy. I feel like class, what's the difference between trust and empathy? Trust is my willingness to be vulnerable when interacting with you, to disclose because I have confidence that you care about my well-being and my best interests. That's trust. And there, are, depending on what you read, there are different kinds of trust. There's, there's calculus-based trust, there's knowledge-based trust, there's identity-based trust, there's relational trust, all these kinds of but in general, trust is something where you know someone well enough that in an uncertain situation, you are willing to give them the benefit of the doubt. You, you have confidence that they will not betray you, that they will not do something that undermines what you value. That's trust. Empathy involves trust, but empathy is working to step into that other person's point of view, that other person's experience, that other person's standpoint. And as Jamie knows, because we're dealing with this in negotiation class right now, there is a tension between being really clear about who I am, I don't want to let go because I'm right, and having empathy for another. And often in the workplace, the reason why those two are in tension is I fear that if I understand the situation as you do, then maybe I'll have to change my own thinking. Well, I'm not going there. Because that makes me a loser. That makes me weak. But that attitude of being a loser, being weak, is all about me. That's an ego thing. That's my own internal psychological needs. That's not working through the conflict. So once again, I'm looking in the mirror. Right. So working to develop trust can help develop empathy. And my guess is that this is, these are things you guys already know. And through empathy, you are able to open up and shift from a debate to a conversation. And that's what dialogue is, it's a conversation. And I know several of you, a number of you, and I know Rob uses this book, are familiar with Crucial Conversations, which required reading in our program for a of you. I just gave you the 10 minute short version of the book. The rest is detail. And that shift from an individualist focus to a dialogic focus is, whoops, sorry, is most useful So if you're sensing tension with an individual, these are important factors, but this is probably where you're experiencing the most. And with a lot of workplace conflict, we sense it at an interpersonal level. So that's where this is helpful. Janet, I have Of course. So what if the has repeatedly reinforced a lack of 
I mean, they've given you reason not to trust them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Can you do it alone? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's I think that's a very very fair question, and it's really easy to stand up here with a clicker and have all the answers, <laughs> and then go off to my office afterward. Um, obviously, I don't know the situation that you're thinking about or the example, but let's say that. I work with someone mm -hmm. and I have trouble trusting them. So one question is, to what degree do I need to trust them in order to function? So is it, is it something that is somewhat peripheral to my core role in the organization? Because look, you guys know, we work with people we didn't choose. Um, or a mosaic, and sometimes you don't necessarily you never want to be a friend with them, but they can be a good coworker, right? So there's a difference in the relationship there. So is the is the trust problem something that could be around the periphery, or is it related to a core function? Let's assume that the answer is yes. It's related to a core function. Now this is very cultural bound. Dominant American direct communicator. I think it's worth considering naming it. That depends on a whole lot of other factors. Um, not necessarily blaming someone, like, I can't trust you. But in order for us to work well in this situation, we need to develop trust. So let's talk about what that looks like. See if there's a way to define it together. In other words, easy to say, hard to do. As you also know, that there are facile answers to everything. But at the end of the day, people—they're just jerks in the world. And sometimes there's nothing you can do to change them. And by the way, to change them, that's up here. They're the jerks, right? They're the bad people. They're getting in the way of your, your success. I don't know. They might be feeling the same about you. <clears throat> and I say that not in judgment of you, but to recognize that it all depends on where you stand, your standpoint. I'm starting, I'm trying to be mindful of our time. I, I don't know if I even yeah. started to, to get at that. So, let me just finish the, the response around trust. So this is sort of a little checklist kind of thing. <coughs> if there are trust issues with a coworker, first question is, okay, how important is trust? And in what ways does that trust have to be in place for us to be able to function and do well in our, in our tasks? If it's relevant, then is there a way to have a conversation around it? If there isn't a way to have a conversation around it, then is there uh, sponsor, uh, supervisor, another person, not in terms of tattling, but who you can engage so that they can help you redefine the working relationship in a way to minimize the trust problems. So, thinking of those, that's just sort of a Does this make sense so far? Okay, the last thing I'm going to cover, then, then we're going to do a quick assessment thing, which will be kind of a, maybe even a take home. We'll skip all this middle stuff. So conflict breaks out. I experience it. I have a choice of how do I deal with it. Do I deal with it by showing how right I am, which is often our first reaction, or by engaging in an open process, and this is the crucial confrontation space. Let's skip this stuff. Another important piece is where do you want to end up at the end of the conflict? And I'm going to just focus on four of these six endpoints. Because conflict could end up throughout an escalation. If you don't if you don't work through it correctly, it's going to escalate. You could reduce it, but it's still there. It's just not quite as painful. Management, I think of in terms of recognizing the conflict is inevitable and it's always there. And so really the question is how do we contain it, how do we harness it, 
so that it is a constructive source of energy rather than a destructive source of energy. And then we get to the, the three, which is much more situation specific. Settlement, settling a conflict is bringing closure to it. Okay, fine, I'll stay late today and get this project done. Settled. You can tell from my tone of voice, I will probably carry resentment. So settlement focuses on behavioral expectation, what's going to happen tomorrow. And often when we deal with conflict, we just settle it. Why? Because it helps us deal with our anxiety for the moment. Resolution focuses on understanding what the underlying trigger or causes of the conflict are. And eliminating the source of the conflict. <clears throat> so, for example, if it's all right, if I use this example, the trust, a trust issue may have nothing to do with people. It may actually be very much a structural issue. Job descriptions are written for them. Team reassignments happen in a way where you are, you are both accountable for something that requires you to step on each other's feet. Nothing personal. It's a structural issue. Think about organizations and how, how job descriptions and team charges and the, how they can create problems. It's not people. It's systems and structures, right? Okay. So resolution would be understanding what the trigger, what the source of the, of the conflict is. Transformation is growth and change where we come to understand ourselves, other situation and context in new ways. It's kind of like when you have that conversation with a, a friend, you've had a misunderstanding and you've been really, really tense, and finally they say, Ken, calm down. Let me explain what was really going on. And as they talk about what led to the situation, I'm going, oh, oh. internal shifts. That's growth and change. Now this, I would argue, is a very important thing for organizations. Transformation. To finish with this slide, if we're in a conflict and we take the upper path, the individualist path, the most likely constructive outcome is settlement. If what you want is transformation, organizational change and growth, or professional change and growth, or even if what you want is a deeper resolution, this probably will not get you there. You actually need to follow a dialogical process. So how you engage with conflict is going to have an impact on where you end up. So as organizational leaders, you do a little triage, and you ask yourself, is this something I just need to deal with today because I've got other priorities and I've got to get back to work? Realizing that I'm moving toward a short-term, perhaps temporary solution, Maybe that's all I can afford, resource or time-wise. So that's where you say, fine, I might be wrong, just do it. An exertion of power. Which is nothing wrong, but there are consequences for every choice. Or if you sense that this is a deeper, more systemic kind of thing, then this kind of stuff probably won't get to what you need to understand. You need to move down to a more dialogic, more interactive, more time consuming. So I got to two slides out of 427. <laughs> so I'm just going to do one other quick thing. Is this useful to think through? I mean, it's pretty abstract, I don't know. But okay, so I'm just going to do one other quick thing. Um, and then give you a handout and we can ask questions or talk or eat or 
opportunities, whatever. So it can sometimes be helpful to think about what are some of the, the events or dynamics that trigger conflict. This is really sort of how you move through it. And I must show them ice cream cones. Okay. These ice cream cones represent a lot of things to me depending on the conversation. Think of this in this moment as standpoint. This is you, this is your coworker. Of course, you have not common ground, not common interest, but shared experience or standpoint. But look at how much they have that is not you, and look at how much you have that is not them. Of course, you're going to be dealing with a difference all the time. And when things are going well, that's complementary and synergistic and all those wonderful business rules. When things are not going well, you're below the line and you sense the gap. So part of what you want to think through when conflict arises is, is the conflict something that can be managed in this whole life can come up here? In other words, there's a shared understanding, there's a common goal, a shared way of thinking, then normative processes like negotiation are perfectly fine. But when you have different standpoints, I'm looking at this from a fiscal standpoint, we don't have the money to invest in this project, and they're saying, but wait a minute, I have this dictate we've got to do. In other words, they have a very different way of thinking than you. But you need to have a different conversation. You need to find not common ground, but you need to find common language to be able to talk about the differences. Okay. So, last thing I'll go over. There are a lot of different ways to understand conflict. What triggers it? What Chris Moore developed this a circular conflict. And I'm just going to give you the five real quick. There are a lot of different triggers, but he talks about five. One possible source for trigger of conflict is what he called data conflict. That this does And data conflict arises when you have different information or different interpretations of information. So, for example, I might ask, how many lights are in this room? It's a fact question. This is the call and response. What, Rob? 27. 27, okay. And so I might say, Rob, how do you arrive at the 27? And he'd say, well, look at the fixtures. One, two, three, four, five. And then, oh, I was really smart. These aren't on, but we've got these other light bulbs here, right? Well, do you include the little lights on my jaw bone thing that light up when I'm not walking often enough? Do you include the projector lamp? Do you include the lights that are under the podium? That's a common source of conflict. We assume that we're working from the same data set when we're not. Or we interpret data in different ways. That's fact or data conflict. Very common source of conflict. Another source of conflict is what's called values conflict, or structure conflict. And this is actually pretty common in organizations. And this relates to relative views of rights and responsibilities. So there are two sides to the coin. One is you perceive that someone is not doing something you believe they should be doing. Or conversely, you believe that someone is trying to do something they shouldn't be doing. So, I'm a team leader, and Susan is a very active team member, and she wants to be really helpful, and so she sends an email out to the team member saying, we're going to have a meeting on Wednesday. And my reaction is, wait a minute, that's my job. I'm the team leader. Don't be sending emails to the team. I get to send emails to the team saying we're meeting on Wednesday, right? Little tiny little things. Structure conflict. I perceive Susan as trying to do something that is out of line. And this often plays out when we are self conscious about our social position in an organization. When we want to be perceived as important and having that an important role, those kinds of things, right? The other side of it is I'm relying on you and you're not doing it. Well, it's not my job, right? It's kind of like you want to. You want to 
give a hungry at a restaurant, you want to place your order, and the kid who comes home with water, you try to give the water away. The order is, no, 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 I'll get your server. Right? That's structure conflict, value conflict. Then there's values conflict, and values conflict relate to those deeper attitudes about right and wrong. And in an organizational setting, this goes to organization and culture and mission and vision, what the organization stands for. <clears throat> then there's interest conflict, which, at least in the law community, this is all the rage. Everybody loves it. Everybody's about interests. The whole world is about interests. Interests relate to individual needs and wants. They have to be satisfied. And I perceive that you're interfering with my ability to meet my own. That can be a source of conflict. And then finally, there's relationship conflict, which I think is misnamed, but that's how Chris refers to it. Relationship conflict is that displaced conflict where I have an issue that comes up. Rob and I have an issue that comes up. His office is right around the corner from mine. And I offend Rob, as I do daily. And Rob says, oh, I'm easy, forget about it. I'm, I'm from Chico, so we're easy. And Rob isn't aware that he hasn't forgotten what happened, even though he let it go. And then I offend him again. And he forgives me, and I offend him again. And over time, things build up. Which takes me back to when that person's coming down the hallway and you suddenly have to tie your shoes. That's relationship conflict. It's the unfinished business. We try to make times, which means that we don't deal with what we need to do. And it follows us. And it can poison relationships. Simply because we have to So these are five potential triggers or sources of conflict. If you understand what is triggering a conflict, your own good judgment can lead you pretty far to figuring out what to do. If it's a data conflict, then let's get an independent source of the data. Let's define what data we're talking about. If it's a structure conflict, then let's not talk about the situation. Let's talk. About, let's define our relationship. Let's, de let's define our working boundaries. If it's a value conflict, then are we in alignment? Can we, are we in alignment with the organization and so on? If it's interest, then let's disclose what those interests are. We don't have to have the same interests because they can, you can have different interests that are compatible. Right? We need to talk about it. And then if it's a relationship conflict, then maybe we do need to talk about the fact that I didn't invite you to my birthday party five years ago. All right. Enough. It's past eight thirty. I'm going to give you an assessment instrument just to take with you. Oh, there it is. Mine was. Have any of you heard of either the Thomas Kilman conflict mode instrument or what's called the Dynad? Is that can you do that? Okay, I'm going to leave you with this last thing, and you can do it on your own. Okay. So, this instrument is built on an a set of assumptions, and that is that each one of us has our own natural style, our own natural predisposition in how we react in conflict situations. And one way we tend to react, and this is me by the way, we're natural avoiders. Go figure, I'm in the conflict, I'm a natural avoider. And that means that when I'm faced with a conflict situation, I don't act out very highly in terms of meeting my own needs, nor do I work very hard to meet the needs of others. I withdraw, that's the difference. Another possible conflict response or reaction is to act only out of concern for myself and not 
act out of much concern for the other person. That's being competitive with the touches. Another option is that I might, my first reaction is to appease them, make them feel good first before I deal with my own needs. That's yielding or accommodating. Or I might try and seek some kind of compromise, which is horse trading. I get something, I give up something. Or I might be a natural collaborator, where I work very hard to meet my own needs and I'm going to work hard to meet my person's needs. These are five, these are called five conflict styles. No one style is better or worse than the other, they're simply different. This instrument takes you about five minutes to do. You fill it out. It suggests what your predisposition is in conflict. It gives you two measures, what's called calm and storm. Calm is when you first recognize that conflict is happening when you're not emotionally invested in it. I'm relatively collaborative at that moment. And then storm is when things heat up, I jump all the way back to the world. Right. So it's useful just to kind of Think about your own style, and then the next step, which you can think about on your own, or ask a friend or someone else to take this, is it's not only what's my style, it's also how does my style mesh with other people. So if I'm an avoider and I have a work colleague who's very competitive, how can I be more successful? Well, if they're competitive, then I may need push, I need to, we need to push myself. Or collaboration. Right? In other words, you can think of strategies. The good news is that you're not hardwired. If you're aware of your predisposition, then you can change your behavior. So this is just something you can take with you and fill out. And I'm going to have to stop here because it's 20 minutes to um, I don't know if this is helpful. I didn't give you a checklist of things because at the end of the day, that checklist will last about a day. What I hope is that this gives you things to think about so that you can be more self aware. So, questions, thoughts, conversation, questions? Yes, Mark. Under values of the honesty, what are typical value conflicts? Um, The way things are done, um, I mean, that's big. I mean, so, okay, so in a non-workplace, let me kind of back into it. In a non-workplace setting, value conflict in a social setting would be the role of government. Should government stay out of your way and you sink or swim on your own, or is the role of government to be more, more national? Regulating the marketplace. That's a value question. That kind of thing. Um, work ethic. Some people say, hey, I have a work life balance that works for me. I've got three children. My partner works hard. I work hard. So at the end of the day, I've done what I can. I need to have a life. Someone else might say, no. You clearly are not committed to your profession, or else you'd be here at midnight working on this project. Those are values. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Other questions, thoughts, reflections? Is this useful? Thank you for giving me your time.